I did have two incidents, one at the residence where I'm at now, where an individual came knocking, looking for me by first and last name, and my landlord had answered the door and basically told me that he was kind of suspicious of the individual. He didn't know who he was, he didn't recognize him. He found it odd that he was asking for me by first and last name, said he was pretty well dressed and had told him that I wasn't home and then immediately came downstairs and let me know that, listen, somebody came looking for you. And I was like, really? So I thought it was maybe somebody from like Optimum or some trying to sell, you know, service or whatever, but it wasn't. He said it was something about him that he kind of got a very bad, like a weird vibe from him. Darcy Weir is an independent researcher and filmmaker who has traveled around the world to study the UFO phenomenon. Back in August of 2020, under a shroud of secrecy, the UAP task force was clandestinely brought into existence within the shadows of the enigmatic U.S. Department of Defense. My questions regarding this phenomenon led me to American oceanographer and retired Rear Admiral Tim Gallaudet. How long did you serve for the Navy and work for NOAA? I served in the Navy for 32 years, and I then worked for NOAA after that for about three and a half years. They're coming from somewhere. Uh, we don't know how they're doing what they're doing, and we don't know their intentions. So uh, all I can say is there, this deserves a significant amount of study uh, of our oceans, and, and that, that's what I'm pursuing right now. When you hear about Navy submarine seamen um, witnessing or noticing on sonar USO activity, objects that are moving, you know, 300 knots plus. I won't use the gentleman's name, uh, even though he's, he's mentioned it public, publicly and has been in print, that during some testing in the, uh, on the, the Los Angeles class improved 688, Los Angeles class fast tuck submarine, the USS Hampton, I think it's SSN 767, they were, they were doing something new with the sonar. And an object was, was being picked up on sonar as a, a fast mover, and it went, went zipping by him. And the sonar operator said, that went by us and in excess of 800 miles an hour. Now, I heard through the grapevine that you had a experience with a, what, some people call a fast mover in the Navy. Can you? Yes, yeah, so I can tell you about that. And what are your thoughts on the USO situation? I mean, I film here nightly, and it's almost every night you catch something that you can't explain. Why do you think that the water is so important to these craft? What's it about our, our oceans that attract them to it? Personally, yeah. I believe that they, I believe that they exist, they, they reside in our oceans. I believe that they have bases or underground facilities. There is, in my view, based on the data of USO activity, there is a very good reason to believe that there are multiple undersea bases that these things operate on. Yes. Now, um, and, and, and some of them would be but definitely off the coast of South America on the Atlantic side. I don't think there's any question in my mind. There's, there's been too many of those types of cases. So you're talking about a global presence what are they doing? What's going on? Welcome back. I'm here today with filmmakers Darcy Weir and Andy Marcial. Gentlemen, welcome. Thank you. Thank you for having us. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, so just to get folks started... I'm going to start with Darcy. Just tell us a little bit about your background and what you're working on. Cool. So I've been making independently documentaries about certain phenomenon and subjects within ufology for better part of a decade now. 
I started off making documentaries about like Phil Schneider and underground bases being taken, which is a abduction documentary. And then I slowly moved into sort of space anomaly subject matter regarding the Apollo manned missions, Gemini, Mercury, all the stuff that came before Apollo, like the X-15, which was the very first space astronaut designated mission. And last year I released one called Fast Walkers, which is all about like the STS missions, building the International Space Station and the anomalies that they saw in space from the late 1970s until the 2000s. So this recent documentary I made is called Transmedium, and it's just talking about the USO phenomenon. And I got to sit down with retired Rear Admiral Tim Gallaudet, who was chief oceanographer for the Navy for seven years. He witnessed the Go Fast UFO video while he was working on a exercise off the coast in the Atlantic Ocean. And that video, after he saw it, he was part of like a thread of other people within the Navy that were working on this exercise. And that was scrubbed from their emails. I guess they weren't supposed to see that anymore. So yeah, really interesting man. His testimony is really important. And I got to speak with this other group of really intelligent people, Mark D'Antonio, who witnessed the USO, Jim Goodall, who wrote a big book about the type of submarines we have around the world. And he's very steeped in the UFO phenomenon, knows what's going on in the oceans too. Richard Dolan, who's a historian on the national security state and UFOs interacting with the militaries of the world and Andy Marcial, who actually is an experiencer himself. And he's responsible for leaking the DHS Department of Homeland Security UAP videos that went pretty viral about two years ago. And he got harassed by the community. Lo and behold, at the end of 2023, Customs and Border Patrol released all of this documentation regarding those UAPs and said they're authentic UAP videos. So yeah, pretty interesting that even our Department of Homeland Security and Customs and Border Patrol are witnessing these things in FLIR when they're trying to look for narcos and all kinds of bad guys trying to get into the country. Andy, tell us about yourself. So I'm technically not a filmmaker, but I did assist Darcy in his film. He reached out to me and asked if I couldn't be a part of it, and I told him yes. But I'm actually into this more from my personal experiences. Since I was a child, I saw and went through things that followed me throughout my life that I had no explanation for, no answers for, and kind of went on my own I guess you could say investigative path, I guess, to try and understand what I went through and what other people were going through and to reach out to them and basically let them know that they're not alone. Because for someone who's experienced it like that, it could be very psychologically damaging, especially for people who have no one to talk to and no one to reach out to in regards to what they went through. So a lot of people tend to hold this in and it can really affect them negatively. When the United States and China clash, the world will never be the same, especially when forces beyond reality threaten to intervene. What if the United States went to war with the People's Republic of China? How would these rivals fight for supremacy on land, sea, air, and across the stochastic streams of time? What wonder weapons would be unleashed? What horrors would emerge from the irradiated sludge of the South China Sea? What heroes would rise and forever change the course of history? Tread into the deepest and darkest dimensions of the multiverse, gaze through a kaleidoscope of fractured realities, and bear witness to the disturbing visions of World War III from today's greatest minds in science fiction, fantasy, and horror. Weird World War, China. Available now from Bain Books at Bain.com. So that was one of the reasons why I created my page. 
And it was also to put out as much legitimate information as possible, because there is still a lot of garbage out there. Instead of complaining about it, I decided, you know, well, let me just take the chance and just start the page to do this. And eventually it got me to get this individual from the Department of Homeland Security to send me these videos when I kind of, I guess you could say, influenced him or, or he motivated him to do it. So I guess getting into this was not a bad idea because it ended up getting me some of the most authentic videos to ever come out in its entirety. Were the videos that you got or that you released ultimately approved by Border Control or was it just kind of a reluctant? No, actually, I released two of them. They were shorter videos compared to the rubber duck, which is about 60 minutes long. That video, because I understood what I had and I understood the length of it and the data that was in it, I actually sent it to the SCU first before releasing it because I want to go through the proper channels before I just threw it out there and had everybody attacking for no reason. When you say SCU, what is that? The uh, Scientific Coalition for UAP Studies. Oh, the organization down in Huntsville, Alabama. Okay. Yeah. Right. So, yeah. They're the ones that actually did the analysis on the 2013 Iwadija footage. They did a full extensive analysis, actually. I believe it was like 200 and something pages long and concluded that the object was anomalous. So they saw this footage and agreed that it was just as significant because I believe that's the footage that they hold at standards when it comes to other videos that they choose to do analysis on. So I guess it fit the criteria they were looking for and decided to do the full analysis. And it took a while, but finally, when it did come out, they concluded that the object was indeed anomalous. So I believe the fact that I leaked it and had that to go with it with the rubber duck may have been another one of the reasons why the CBP went forward with releasing it on their website, calling it anomalous and putting it out to the public. So, Okay. So this current documentary is about transmedium USOs. For someone who just fell off the turnip truck, what is a transmedium USO? Yeah. So this terminology has been thrown around for a little while now. It really became more front and center in news media reporting on UAPs during 2000, I think, 22 when the debrief released an article in which they had done a Freedom of Information Act request to find out about objects in the oceans. And they got a hold of some emails that were communications between military officials within the Navy that were communicating about UAPs that exhibited trans medium capabilities, meaning that they could move from the atmosphere, which is a mm -hmm. gaseous fluid, into the ocean, unimpeded, continuing with speed at the exact same rate that it was moving through the atmosphere. And that's not normal. Usually the frictions that are involved, even in our atmosphere, would slow down craft. But when they hit the ocean, for sure, ocean water doesn't compress. So you've got to feel some kind of friction, some kind of gravity when you hit the oceans. And so these objects have been monitored by our Navy. It's super classified, but what has been spoken of by certain people that have been investigating this over the decades, Mark D'Antonio being one who actually witnessed a USO when he was on board of a submarine, I think in the 90s, he wouldn't say exactly when, but I tried to sort of get an approximation based on his testimony to me in the documentary. I think it was the 90s. He was in the sonar shack and he saw this all go down and report to the XO, who was one of the commanders on deck, that a was, was fast he, mover. Was he an officer or was he enlisted? Like He was a civilian. Specialist. He was a oh, guest. He was a okay, guest. That's, that's even more interesting. All right. Sorry. Continue. Was he a yeah, PhD? Yeah. Like, why was he on a submarine? To advertise on Through Glass Darkly, email Through Glass Darkly ads at gmail.com. 
Yeah, he does have a PhD. He was invited as a guest to do some work for them, which is classified as well. He's not allowed to talk about that, but he is allowed to talk about his experience when he was on board this submarine. Did he and, tell you uh, what type of submarine? Was it like a nuclear ballistic submarine? Was it a... I think so, yeah. It, especially okay. in the 90s, our fleet is quite upgraded by then. So like a Los Angeles class type? Well, I don't know. If it... Probably, yeah. Like an SS, okay. SSN something, you know, 775, I don't know. But, okay, um, so it's powered by both a nuclear reactor and is carrying submarine-launched bl- ballistic missiles, which have most likely tipped. Yeah, most okay. likely because that's pretty much what the fleet that we're operating now. Most of them would have that capability. Either have a small thermonuclear reactor or carry that and thermonuclear warheads, right? Right. Jim Goodall, who I also spoke to, he rode on a Los Angeles class and that was armed to the teeth with nuclear warheads. Right. So, yeah, I mean, the fact that what Mark D'Antonio witnessed was an object that was moving at at least 300 knots. And that's like for for folks who don't know how fast 300 knots you saw my eyes widen how fast is the fastest at least from publicly available data on how fast uh, the fastest military submarine can travel just for reference yeah anywhere between 37 to 40 knots i think when they're really cruising probably about 40 knots max publicly available probably that's what we know pr- yeah classified but well, I don't know. Well, that. I don't know that answer, but that's typically how it's done. Okay, yeah. so you're talking something that's almost 10x what our fastest top yeah. of the line submarines can travel. Okay. More than 10x, yeah. And so, what is that? You know, we don't know. It's a un- unidentified submerged object. Is basically what we're alluding to. And Wait, the Navy, so, so is it? You're talking roughly 40 knots per hour. And this is traveling at roughly 300 knots per hour. I want to make sure I get the time. That's right. Yeah. Okay. And so when he was listening to this conversation between the XO and the sonar operator, they were surprised and said, what do you want me to do, sir? And the XO said, just log it and dog it. And Mark had heard through the rumor mill in the Navy that this was a quite common occurrence. And he actually started doing research into this and looking at I guess his access to certain information through his security clearance that many ships have recorded in their logs, these types of objects, they're moving through the ocean at incredible speeds beyond what we're capable of doing that's on record. And Where on so, the planet did this happen? What part of the world? This particular he, wouldn't say, he wouldn't say. He wouldn't say. Okay. Yeah. I released the trailer for my documentary And Jim Goodall talks about a gentleman that saw an object or witnessed an object moving through the ocean when he was riding a Los Angeles class submarine. And that individual saw my trailer, reached out to me and said, I'm the guy. So I've got to interview that guy since he reached out to me. Is this Um, the sonar operator? It was somebody else that was riding on board a Los Angeles class submarine that was interviewed and Ralph Blumenthal mentioned mm-hmm. this encounter in Jeremy Corbell's recent To Be TV docu series, and it's Bob McGuire. So Bob McGuire is somebody who's been working as a third party contractor with the National Reconnaissance Office, and he's done satellite stuff, but apparently he's done submarine stuff, right? Mm-hmm. And he witnessed a USO as well. So this is just the case. Like the interesting thing is that apparently when they log them, these USOs, the submarine operators, they call them jellyfish because they have no other word or name to describe them. They just want to pass it off because they're not like threatened by them. I would say they just need to label them something. 
And there's no systematic effort to make the evidence disappear or any kind of culture of just ignore it. We see it all the time. Don't report it because your career might be negatively impacted for reporting a ghost. Anything like that? Or is there kind of a culture of just it was there, report it and don't spend much time on it? Yeah, I think based on my conversation with Tim Gallaudet, there seems to be a database that's being kept, which is recording and keeping track of these interactions that the Navy's having with these objects. It might be called the Fast Mover Program. And he believes he knows this third party repository that's keeping that information. And he's trying to make efforts to get right into that at this point. Is that a naval organization that's tracking it or is it some other? It, it's not Navy. It's third party. So think National Geospatial Agency, mm -hmm. something like that. Okay. So it's kind of a civilian agency that's linked to that. that yeah. That's it's a military. That, was there any kind of cultural clash between submariners and like the surface fleet pilots and stuff like that, where they don't necessarily share these contacts or is there no such division? They kind of share everything in the Navy. I don't, I don't know. I couldn't say if there was like a culture clash, but maybe you should ask Tim. Yeah. If he'll let me interview him, I'll ask him all the questions. You probably won't be able to answer half of them because they'll be, you know, I'll go straight into the classification. So just as an aside, are you familiar with the Pescagoula abduction incident? Yeah, 1973, Alabama. You know Calvin what's in Parker. Pescagoula? Yeah, yeah. What's in Pescagoula? <laughs> There's a Navy shipyard there, isn't there? Yeah, what do they build? Submarines. Yeah, nuclear attack submarines. Yeah. So you think Navy men abducted Calvin Parker and... No, no. I think... Well, we didn't even get into that. I didn't even ask you the question yet. But much like on the surface... And again, I don't know the answer to this, but I'm going to ask you this question. There appears to be, I haven't run the analysis myself, but a high correlation between these sightings of at least... If you look at nuclear missile bases, the Malmstrom incident back in 1967... There tends to be a high correlation of sightings associated with nuclear materials or nuclear bases. So Pescagoula, oh, yeah. I didn't even know that until recently, but I think they actually worked in Pescagoula potentially at one of these plants. So given this interest, when you were cataloging some of these incidents that were happening, did you ever delve into the correlation between diesel submarines and this thing versus nuclear submarines? Or was there a higher correlation with nuclear ballistic missile submarines? Yeah. Versus, you know, submarines is just with a nuclear reactor. But I mean, we're touching on stuff that's like probably highly guarded stuff. So, Absolutely. And again, we're just guys with no active security clearances right now, just talking, right? So, yeah, just riffing. Well, like, that is what I was getting to in the documentary, that most of these USO sightings were around active exercises where either the submarines or the fleet had nuclear capabilities. And there's been aircraft carriers and such that have been sworn by UFOs and USOs that are carrying thermonuclear warheads. So I think, yeah, you're absolutely- And they're also nuclear, they also have nuclear reactors. They're also powered by yes. Nimitz and stuff like that as, as a nuclear power plant. So- Yeah, yeah. They can run at sea for like 80 years straight, right? I'll take your word for that. I don't know, but it sounds right. Uh, yeah, like one, of, one yeah. of the aircraft carriers could with their nuclear reactors. Okay, so- when you looked into this, when you started asking questions about that in the documentary, where did it lead you? Well, just the fact that there's so many sightings, there's so much going on in terms of activity in the oceans or around the oceans that we need to further study the oceans. I mean, like right now, if you listen to this new whistleblower, David Grush, he's mentioned that non-human intelligence that may be interacting with us, with our planet, could be 
a few different flavors. There could be trans-dimensional beings, extraterrestrial, and Hal Putoff wrote a book about these crypto-terrestrials, something that might exist here or have existed here for a long time that we just don't get exposed to a lot, that frankly are out of sight and out of sound most of the time. And what better place would you like to reside out of sight and out of sound if you were some kind of non-human intelligence trying to exist here at the same time we are than existing in the oceans? Because the oceans are vast, they cover up 70% of the planet and 90% of the planet. And like, we're not in the oceans most of the time. We're just skimming the surface. And if we do go to the deepest parts of the ocean, we're just jumping in deep submersible and going down like an elevator to the very bottom in a small craft and then coming back up. We're not like really blanketing the ocean when we travel through it. So there's a lot to be discovered there. And I find that if these discussions are happening about non-human intelligence that may exist here alongside us, that could be existing in a domain like this, like the oceans. Were there any particular hotspots globally where these returns tend to be the most frequent? Yeah, off the coast of Puerto Rico, that seemed to be coming up a lot in my research. Mm -hmm. You know, people have been discussing the Bermuda Triangle for many, many decades now. It's been written in history books from the early voyages of Christopher Columbus. So, yeah, this is definitely an area that I think is a hot spot near the Catalina Island off the coast of California seems mm-hmm. to be a hot spot. There's the Black Sea apparently has had lots of activity and the Arctic and Antarctic areas, Russia and the United States Navy fleets have witnessed stuff. So when you say the Black Sea, is that a recent phenomena or has that been long before 2014 when the Russians kind of started yeah, the Crimea, Russians. Crimea, yeah. Yeah, Richard Dolan was discussing how some Russian researchers had found activity happening in the sea there back in the 70s, 80s, 90s. Okay, so it tends to be kind of a long standing kind of phenomena. How far back does this go? You said 70s, 80s, but it doesn't go back any farther. Does 1800s. I mean, oh, so long, like way, yeah, way, way yeah. Back. There's a lot of accounts. There's actually Japanese accounts. I mean, real old ones where they've seen USOs objects coming out of the water. Can Plenty you say a little bit more about, like at least an incident, or I don't recall the exact date and location and all that, but I do know that in Japan there is a famous one that was documented in ancient times. Is this like it's a bune? It's a bune. Um, I'm not. Yeah, like I said, I'm not exactly sure of the name, but I do know that there is a famous one where they actually drew a depiction of the object and had seen it exiting the water. I believe it was exiting the water or sitting on the surface of the water, if I'm not mistaken. But yeah, they've been seen all over the place. Okay, and then what about in the Baltic Sea? Are you familiar with what? Ocean X was doing and the structure artifact. I mean, they don't really know what it is. There's just a lot of magnetic anomalies whenever they approach it. And it looks like the Millennium Falcon. Uh, yeah, I mean, from- based off of the images, the red, the scanned images. Yeah, it's odd. But the way I look at it is if this really was something like that, I'm sure military or something would have been all over that a long time ago. So the fact that they aren't and they're just allowing people to go down there and investigate what this is. I really don't think it's anything that significant. They've, they've in my developed opinion. channels. They developed channels with the Ocean X people. I, I mean, I somebody recently, and they didn't say too much, but they definitely are. I know there was some some odd things that, especially when they first found, if I'm not mistaken, like the instrumentation would shut off and it wasn't working and stuff like that, which is interesting. 
but from based off the images that I'd seen of the object, it just looked like a stone mound unless... Yeah, the Y files actually did a pretty good expose on that, discussing it, mm -hmm. saying they kind of debunked it, saying that it was just something geologic. But we haven't heard much from the Ocean X team since then, which is kind of strange. Why? Yeah, um, I think my understanding is it was a fundraising issue. Like there was a lot of skepticism over the discovery. So it made it much more difficult to raise money for an additional expedition. And it could very well have been debunked, right? And that's probably where the wind may have been blowing in terms of them able to raise money. So, yeah. Okay. So, but you guys don't really delve into it in this particular documentary. No. Right. No. What was the most interesting thing that you kind of picked up from this? There's something that surprised you that you weren't quite expecting before you started doing your research on this. Yeah. I think what people don't realize too about the 2017 Tic Tac incident with the Nimitz they were tracking those objects over the ocean for a week, right? Like for four or five days, Kevin Day and the people that were on board the ship. Mm -hmm. This guy, Chris Sharp, who runs Liberation Times in the UK, he journalist, spoke, right? yeah, a journalist who's covering this stuff pretty seriously. He wrote an article about how Apparently, there's documentation and there was a scientific analysis of all the stuff that was going on in the ocean around the Tic Tac event. And those objects were being reported to have been emanating from a very large object that was inside the ocean. And if you listen to the accounts from David Fravor and Alexandra Dietrich, Mm -hmm. They saw an object, they saw something causing like frothing of the water below the Tic Tac. And the Tic Tac was kind of sitting above the ocean. So it seems that that larger object that maybe this radar information and all this stuff that they have on the Tic Tac, which is not public yet, confirms that there's this presence in the ocean and the Tic Tac and these other objects that were seen just like the Tic Tac were emanating from it. And the object that they claim to have seen it emanating from, is there any remote chance that it's just some advanced nuclear submarine that they misidentified that was launching a drone? I have to ask all the questions, my friend. I think that's preposterous. I think Kevin Day is competent enough to be able to see what the like, sonar returns are in addition to radar and things like that. But... I mean, is there any chance it could have been some submarine that had some sort of drone program? I don't know. Why would we spend billions of dollars on servicing these submarines if we could have a whole fleet of these ocean-going alien reproduction vehicles? You know what I mean? I would hope that that's not the case because it's a slap in the face to the public, but... Maybe for national security reasons, they can't talk about that. And that could be some of this technology we're seeing is actually super black budget military tech, right? Are they spooking their own Navy men and carrying out these tests on them to see how they react and how a F-18 gets scrambled and interacts with these Tic Tac craft? I don't know. But Look, it's possible, but it's, it's highly, possible. highly irresponsible, right? Because you're, yeah, I mean, like you're helps. dealing with, I, like you're risking people's lives, right? Like in a very, very high op tempo environment where you have all sorts of things flying through the air that multi billion dollar equipment. I mean, you know, a carrier costs about twenty billion dollars to produce. So, like, this is not something that the U.S. military would just do for shits and giggles right but look it's possible but i don't even know if it's plausible but it's, i think it's i wouldn't even say it's possible. probable I, i'm sorry to cut you off but the only reason i would say that's to me is just ridiculous because again this goes back to 
God knows how many years this phenomenon. Mm -hmm. But when we had the biggest boon in UFO sightings was when we started detonating nukes in our oceans. Mm -hmm. And I believe it started Bikini Atoll around the 40s and lasted like 12 years. And then I shared some footage with Darcy. I'm not sure at the time he even knew existed, but on some of those videos of the detonations, there's one in particular, I don't remember exact name of the footage, but it's one of the famous ones that you can find. They almost did like a small little like movie about it in a sense. It's the one where they has the fleet in the ocean and they detonated just to see like what damage it does to the boats, I believe it is. I think it's, it's hydrogen, that footage. Yeah, it's a yeah, hydrogen I, bomb test. Uh, yeah. So during the explosion, like there's going to be no planes around the initial blast right. zone. You, you right. just can't. The EMP would render their engines obsolete. And fall Even the if they're doing it inside of the water, you're still not going to be anywhere near it because the potential danger is there. So in this footage, though, you clearly see in one of them where there's up to six objects that appear out of nowhere. Like literally, it's the blast of water going up, clear sky around it. And then all of a sudden, right around this blast of water, about six or seven objects, I believe, appear. These white objects just sitting perfectly still right around the blast zone. I mean, literally near it, right next to it. There's no plane would be anywhere near it because the one that is close to it is recording it from a distance. You know what I'm saying? And there's other ones too. There's one where you can actually see it looks to be about two or three disc-like objects right inside of the blast zone, like right next to the mushroom cloud moving in a formation and those are authentic videos those okay, so it's not like there's any chance that it's some like artifact on the oh no camera it's video it's you can actually see discrete discs yeah moving could, across from frame to frame yeah you could see them you could see them and if these things do reside in our ocean just think about okay just for example a whale when a whale makes its sound you can hear a blue whale how many miles away can you hear it right because sound travels energy travels through water very well so now think of the impact that a nuclear detonation in our ocean would have if there is an intelligent race living somewhere in the bottom that's going to mess them up pretty good it's going to create a situation for them because now what we're doing up here is enough to directly affect them in a negative way. You understand? So if that is the case, then that kind of makes sense as to why sightings skyrocketed after that because of the potential danger that we now pose to their existence down there somewhere. You understand? Yeah. I mean, like for a while, people were talking about UFOs arriving on scene here when we were testing out nuclear weapons and they always theorized, well, they're coming from outer space. They're coming from another star because the blast of this energy is so great that they're detecting it from this other star, Zeta Reticuli or something like that. But it would make more sense if they actually existed here in our oceans undetected. And then we start testing out these nuclear arsenals and they're like, all right, the monkeys are at it again. Let's go see what's going on up there. And they start being visible to us. It could be both. It could be that they've been here or have bases here and use our planet like a base, you understand? But they are coming in and out. Some might stay here, others might leave, you know, the same way we live at home. And then when we want to go somewhere and get in our cars, drive down the block. It could be something as simple as that. Now, when you interviewed folks for this documentary, did you interview any government officials or Navy officials who had a theory or a hypothesis around what these things might be? Or did people shy away from that? I think, didn't Gallaudet mention it's exclusively that he believed it was aliens? Yeah, I think Tim said that he thinks these craft are being operated by non-human intelligence because to his knowledge we do not have anything in our arsenal both in the oceans and in the air that has this type of capability so he said he thinks there's an extra by the way we better hope here. nobody else has it because if they do 
we're screwed. That's what yeah, drives Russian, me crazy about what yeah, the Russians me, or the Chinese. That's what drives me crazy about hearing our own intelligence officials at Arrow, as an example, try to suggest that it might be a peer competitor. Like if that's technology from a peer competitor, then they're no longer our peers. They're just about ready to dominate us. That's to me is even more horrifying that it's from somewhere else. Now, when you say alien, do you mean NHT? Do you mean interdimensional? Do you mean ET, like off world? Did he specify? I think he is open to the possibilities of any non-human intelligence, right? So maybe something off world, maybe something from here that we haven't fully disclosed to the public yet. Maybe something dimensional. Yeah. The possibility is literally endless. Just, I mean, you mentioned the Pascagoula, right? And the interesting thing right. about that is actually a good example because those beings that were reported in, during that incident have never, ever been reported again by anyone else. The only known incident we have were those beings of that specific Look. appearance. Yeah, yeah. So wherever document it's literally never ever happened again so maybe we have multiple things happening it could be interdimensional i mean just look at the size of the universe it's impossible that it's only interdimensional there has to be something else out there too that has some kind of advanced capabilities but then there has to be something else as well it may not even be technological it may be in a whole nother realm that is beyond us that will make even less sense to us than the technology that these beings are using in this reality you understand what i'm saying it could be something completely completely different that we just ne would never ever be able to comprehend those possibilities are there you know like all of this possibility is there and michael there key masters he even mentions the theory of time travelers like maybe what we're witnessing is us from the future coming back and seeing us and investigating through history what we're doing. Now, when you were putting together this documentary, was there anything you learned that horrified you? Horrified? I think how unsophisticated our Navy arsenal is. It's really just boats and inflated tubes sailing through the water and how unprepared they would be if something that exhibits these flight capabilities, if that turned hostile on our Navy forces, I think that would be not a fair fight at all. No way. We wouldn't stand a chance. But if that was the case and they wanted to be violent, I mean, honestly, would we still be around at this point right now? No way. Like if that well, was the case, if that was the intent, there wouldn't be well, any of there, it. There's other now. things that they can do that w they wouldn't even need. I mean, they could use basic biology, right? Just yeah. I mean, it's throwing a pandemic and you could wipe out all of humanity pretty easily. Yeah. I mean, look, if I wanted to wipe out humanity, that's how I'd do it. It's, it's clean, simple. If you have different biology. So yeah, there are lots of horrific things they can do. Okay. So in the course of putting together this documentary, you're effectively staring into the abyss. Did the abyss stare back? I'll start with you, Darcy. Yeah, I'm entranced. I think the runtime for this documentary is an hour and 53 minutes, so it's almost two hours long, and I feel like I packed in as much information as I could that was relevant to this thesis, but there's so much more, and... I think I'm going to have to release more and speak to more people that have had experiences with this phenomenon in the oceans, either over the oceans or in the ocean itself. And if even some of your listeners know of some cool stories, I'm totally open to hearing that. So people can go to my website, occultjourneys.com, write me an email and I'll look into it. Did anything happen to you, though, in terms of surveillance and things like that? 
Well, yeah, I was telling you before we started recording, like I was on a interview last night and <laughs> finished the interview. And then about an hour later, I came back to my computer and there was somebody that was remotely controlling my desktop and snooping around my email and going into folders. It was pretty creepy. First time I've really witnessed that. I don't know if I've ever had a more secretive look at the stuff that I've got through three letter agencies or something, but this was pretty disconcerting. And I reached out to a friend who I used to work with in IT, who's like a security guy. And he walked me through all these things I could do to sort of like clean up my computer and lock it down, advised me to basically reformat the computer and just get a fresh install on it because there's so many ways they can cling on to you, your stuff once they've invaded it. So yeah, that was pretty creepy. And I can only imagine why somebody would want to start investigating and looking into my private stuff now. Well, it was particularly on your rig for the documentary, right? Where you made the documentary. And it was kind of off the shelf software, right? It was like, what was it? What did they use? Well, from what I gathered, they sent me a spam email earlier in the day yesterday. And I opened it up just being like, what is this? And the type of malware, like the backdoor Trojan that was installed on my computer only needs you to open an email. That's all. You don't have to click on anything in the email. It literally invades your computer that way. So people be really careful. Now that I know this, I'm never going to open spam again. I'm just going to send it right to the trash. What was the topic of the spam? Just out of morbid curiosity. The, the topic of the spam was actually weird because usually I don't get this type of spam to my personal email. It comes to my studio email all the time. but I got this in my personal email. So I was like, why is this type of thing showing up? And it was something about like crystals, like kind of that hippie crystals stuff. And I was like, what is this? So I opened it on my desktop and there you go. They were in. So I didn't know till later in the day. I guess they didn't really try, but they had run a Microsoft remote desktop session through like Microsoft Edge remote mm. desktop or something like that. So I, use, I had they use your browser. They use like the Edge browser to get in. Yeah. Do you yeah. use the Edge browser or is that just? I don't use the Edge browser. I was actually using Brave browser. And so I found that weird when I saw that app was running. But I guess they might have ran an install of it or something. I removed it like right after. And how did you find out it, like somebody was snooping around? Like, what did you see on your computer? I walked into my office that I'm sitting in right now. I turned on the TV screen because I use a OLED TV, organic LED, which has like pretty true color reporting. And the mouse was moving around the screen and my gut dropped because I'm like, somebody's on my computer. And they were going into my email, they were going into my Google Drive, and they had opened up some folders on my computer. This wasn't just randomly moving cursor. This was with intent, going through and basically viewing or investigating your documentary. I don't know if they were investigating my documentary. I actually had the editing software open, so... I don't know if I had left it open from earlier in the day, probably did leave it open. So they might've been like, oh, look at this, he's editing. But they were looking through my email and in my Google Drive, which was weird. And I checked if I had sent anything. So I checked my sent folder to see if they were like sending anything for my email. And I checked the recent open files, like Google Docs and stuff like that in my Google Drive and I saw that they opened a file that I don't want to talk about, but they opened a file like regarding crypto stuff, like mm -hmm. information. Cause I like crypto, I think 
Bitcoin and all that stuff is very interesting to me. But yeah, it was scary. It's pretty creepy. Andy. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I hesitate to ask because you've already shared some of this with me. What happened to you? <laughs> so, again, like we were talking before off air, I guess you could say. So when I originally released the Department of Homeland Security videos, I did have three very odd incidents. This is like roughly around two years ago, right? Yeah, yeah roughly around two years ago. Okay, um, actually that... All right, I have a theory now. Okay, keep keep going. I'll tell you. Yeah, and I've never I've never had anything like this happen to me. The only people that come looking for me is my friends, or anything like that. I, I'm not signed up for anything where anybody would want to come looking for me. But I did have two incidents. One at the residence where I'm at now, where an individual came knocking, looking for me by first and last name, and my landlord had answered the door, and basically told me that he was kind of suspicious of the individual he didn't know who he was he didn't recognize him he found it odd that he was asking for me by first and last name said he was pretty well dressed and had told him that i wasn't home and then immediately came downstairs and let me know that listen somebody came looking for you and i was like really so i thought it was maybe somebody from like optimum or some trying to sell you know service or whatever but it wasn't he said it was something about him that he kind of got a very bad, like a weird vibe from him. This and guy wearing the, like a suit, sort of well? Not in a suit suit, but the way he was dressed was very professional. So that was the first incident. And I did find it odd because, again, everything about that entire uh, situation just, it wasn't normal for me, at least. It wasn't normal. Then about a week or two later, my mom told me that a woman stopped by her house looking for me again asking for me by first and last name and when she brought that up i was like okay what's going on i said did you get a name she said she wouldn't give me her name i said you asked what she wanted she said she refused to tell me what it is she wanted from me i said you see what she was driving and she told me it was a black suv so the, that after the no because the driveway is fairly long so she would have to actually walk down to actually get a good look at the plates but those two incidents were kind of odd because I've never had, like I said, anybody just randomly come looking for me like that by first and last name. So that was a little weird. And then I had another incident, which was the weirdest of all, was I was in my room with my little brother one day and I was sitting editing on my phone. I had no sound coming from it or anything. And he's playing his video games and I kind of heard something that caught my attention and i was like what the hell was that so i brushed it off at the beginning i didn't think anything of it continue doing what i'm doing and then i hear it again and i kind of got a little startled because it sounded organic like i literally thought at first i thought it was like yes do i have a ghost in my house or some shit because that's what it sounded like you know it sounded something like that so i look at my little brother i'm like do you hear that he said no so I told him to pause the game and we're listening again to see if we hear it and we heard it again. And that's when I realized it was coming out of my phone and me and my little brother look at each other and I told him, pull out your phone and start recording to see if it happens again. So he does, he starts recording and I'm explaining what happened. And as I'm explaining right out of the speaker of my phone, I hear literally this, it was, like someone taking a deep breath, like as if they were just sitting, listening on the phone. And the hairs just stood up on the back of my neck everywhere. And I look at my little brother and I was like, okay, I'm not going crazy. And it happened again. I think it happened another two or three times afterwards. I looked at my phone. I closed all my apps. I made sure there was nothing open that could have possibly been making this sound. There was nothing I was editing that had a sound like that in it. It was literally like you sitting on the phone and listening to the person you're speaking to on the other side, just breathing. And I have it on video, so I'm not making this up. Do you think, based on what you heard, do you think it was 
an accident that they did that? Or do you think it was a message? They were deliberately trying to let you know that someone was watching you. I thought of it, but I think it was something like that. My personal feeling on the whole situation was just kind of letting me know that we took notice of you, I guess you could say. But nothing else after that really happened. But those were the three most interesting things that occurred to me when I released the footage. Oh, oh, and I was mentioning also before this, my Linktree account. That was interesting because I was getting a lot of attacks on Instagram. Not attacks like from people, but from Instagram itself. I was constantly getting warnings about my posts and getting things removed. And I would be banned for a couple of days. I mean, like it was nonstop, nonstop. So I used to promote my Linktree account. And in my Linktree account, I had tons of information that I would post up there for free for people to go on and look through. And I had tons of CIA and FBI documents. I mean, you name it. Things that I had found from people that had posted uh, multiple files on, I believe it was on a Reddit thread. So I had downloaded the entire thing and put it there for everybody to access. And again, after releasing the DHS videos, for some reason, Instagram wouldn't allow me to post my link tree anymore. It kept on coming up as malicious. And after maybe about a month or two, I would try to access my Linktree account and it would say that it didn't exist, but I never once deleted. I never once went into to deactivated nothing. I looked on Google. My name wouldn't come up. As a matter of fact, for a good while, my name wouldn't even come up on Google when you tried to find my Instagram. Like NYUAP discussion mm -hmm. wouldn't come up at all. Like Was zero. Was that the primary zero means by which you released the video? Was it Instagram? Yeah. Instagram and YouTube. Did they do anything to YouTube? Did it get flagged on YouTube? For well, them? not they didn't. I didn't so give them. A, I didn't give them a time. I didn't give them a chance to do it because after all of the negative bull crap that I went through to prove a point after what I was being called a grifter and that I was doing this for money, blah blah blah. I literally took the videos, which when I first released the Rubber Duck, that video is it's literally the only video I've ever posted or anything that ever went viral. That actually went super viral. I had, I believe, it was in a matter of like. A day or two, it had almost 300,000 views. But well, once it goes like that, it's too late for them to stop it, right? Yeah, but because I don't do this for any other reason than to just do the right thing by the subject and try to put out truth or whatever, I took it real personal because here I am trying to do the right thing with footage that has never come out in this manner in its entirety. No government oversight or whatever or releasing a snippet here it was the actual full files i mean for god's sakes it's 40 full minutes of this object that was captured in the rubber duck that's unheard of you know i mean go fast uh, and gimbal and all that were only a few seconds you understand this is an entire file with all of the information everything that could be used for full analysis and full research and then to get the freaking backlash that i got from a lot of the big wigs in ufo community i just got pissed off and took them right off of youtube i literally took all the videos down and left it like that for weeks and then finally after a while and i kind of cooled down or what i posted it back up because people wanted me to reshare it so they can see them again and they've been up since but yeah i literally at one point like i said for weeks i couldn't even pull up my Instagram, my NYUAP discussion, that name itself would not appear on Google. I mean, I'm not a genius when it comes to computers, but I know enough to know that if it's not coming up on Google, something had to have happened in order for that information to not show up because everything shows up on Google. You Google yeah, anything. Somebody senior shows. in some organization called the management of Google and said, yeah, I mean, it had to be, there's just no way. Yeah. There's no way. I even had people sh uh, telling me that it wouldn't show my page wouldn't show up on their Instagram and in, in certain countries or whatever. Like they did mess with me for a good while after the release of those videos. Yeah. What it sounds like to me, what happened was the people who visited you were probably doing an investigation to uncover whoever the leaker was. And they probably were going to interview you. They probably found out who the leaker was through other means, which is probably why they never came back. 
Right. Probably. So that's, I thought about that's, that. That's, too, that's, yeah. that's my theory. Now, the phone thing, that's a little creepier. That might just be an intimidation sort of tactic. Like, so, you know, we're watching you. Just to let you know. Yeah, that was that was we're that was you. really weird. That was really, right, even now, now when I li- I watched the video, it's like, oh. Now, really quickly, you mentioned I think prior to the interview, or actually the beginning of the interview, you've had other interactions with something else. Do you have like a quick rundown of kind of your anomalous experiences to the extent that you can? I know we're like at the end. I I could go through it real quick. Like I said, it's the main reason why I got into this is because since I was younger in Puerto Rico, I've had experiences. One of my earliest recollections, and I've always found it odd throughout my life that this one memory of my childhood was the only one that ever stuck in my brain. Nothing else ever did. Like I can remember little things here and there, but this one memory, for some reason, just, I mean, it just kept replaying in my head over and over and over throughout my life. And I used to always attribute it to that I just saw a plane. But as I got older and started really saying, you know, like whenever it would pop up in my head again, I'm like, okay, let me meditate on this a little more. I could say, like, why am I constantly thinking of this moment? So one day I decided to kind of like really, when the memory came back, started really dissecting it. And what had happened was, I would say I was probably about seven years old or eight years old when it happened. Mm-hmm. And we were up in the mountains visiting some, I believe it was either family or family friends. And in Puerto Rico, my grandmother lives in the mountains in an area called Atalaya. And it's very high up, very high up in elevation where we go. You got I mean, it takes a while to get up the mountain. So where we are is a pretty decent distance away from the closest airport to us, which is Aguadilla Airport. And the only other airport, major airport, is in San Juan. So you have two major airports in Puerto Rico. There may be other smaller ones, but nothing, you know, that commercial airliners land on. So for many years, I attributed what I saw to a plane, a commercial plane. But when I started thinking about it, I'm like, okay, my memory was of me playing outside. It was dark. I was outside in the front. And above me was a dark object, very, very large. And I remember it being large because I had to turn my head to see the full scope of the object that was sitting over me. And it was close. I'm talking very, very close, like probably like right above the tree line, right? Maybe 50, 60 feet up. And on each point, I remember seeing red lights. And if I recall, there were three. So that the shape that I got in my mind was of a triangle object. and. There was no sound. It was literally hovering over me. That's what I remember. And once I looked up and kind of noticed it, it's like something kind of just told me to look up. All I remember is whatever this was took off and just slowly drifted off to the distance and disappeared. So again, after thinking about it, I'm like, it couldn't have been a plane because a plane at that height, I would have known. It would have been pretty obvious what it was. So. That's when I kind of began to like kind of go back to it and say, okay, maybe I saw something else. But the next one that happened to me is the event that just changed my entire life, like literally everything. And it actually happened right next door to where I'm at here on Long Island during the early 90s, around 93, I believe. And I had just moved to Long Island from the Bronx because we moved from Puerto Rico to the Bronx. And I was outside, a clear, sunny day during, I believe it was midsummer. There was no clouds. And I'm playing in the pool when my cousin, well, my best friend used to call my cousin. And just something told me to look up again, similar to the first incident that I just told you. And right over my house. I don't know how else to like say it, but it was literally sitting over my house, probably a good 150, 200 feet away from me was a disc like just sitting there, broad daylight, no lights, nothing was the actual craft. And I kind of did a double take because I saw it at first when I looked up and then I looked up again and I was like, okay, what is that? And I looked to my left and my, my friend was seeing it too. He was staring right at it. 
So I, I knew at least from seeing him that I wasn't imagining that this is there because he's also looking at it. So I would have to say, I would estimate it was probably about 50, 60 feet in diameter. The best way I could describe it was like looking at a DeLorean, like brushed aluminum finish in a sense, like a shiny, but not shiny. Kind of like and a gun metal. Shiny something gun like metal. gun metal. Yeah. Something like gun metal. Mm. And I'm looking at it. It then begins to move to the left of us, which is east. And I always say that the weirdest part of this entire thing was the movement, because the only way I can describe it is, I mean, just think about it. This thing is static in the sky. It's not moving at all. And then all of a sudden, it just starts moving very slowly. I would say it was probably going like at the perspective and distance of where I was, 10 miles per hour, 15 miles per hour at most. Mm -hmm. It was very slow. So, and I know that something like that can't stay in flight without falling. You know what I'm saying? Plus there was no wings. There was no tail. It was not, it was a perfect disc. It literally reminded me of Bob Lazar's sports model. And so it's moving to the left. And the way I could describe its movement is you ever seen somebody recently actually uh, brought up a good explanation for it, but quantum locking. Have you ever heard of that? No. Where it's where they take like the, the super cooled like uh, piece of metal or something, and it gets into oh, like a magnetic metal, lock. And the thing just just sits there, and they're kind of yeah. moving the thing back and forth. Okay, that is yeah. that. That's probably the best. I never thought of that. I used to use the example of air hockey when the hockey puck is just floating in. You kind of tap it, and it moves. But when that person brought up the quantum locking, I was like, wow, that's actually an even better explanation because that is literally, literally how it looked. Like the movements and everything were identical to that phenomenon. So it moved to the left of us, which was going east. And at one point, another piece of the sighting I remember is when the sun reflected off of it, which it might not seem like anything important, but it is important because that's more data now getting to you to show you that this is real you understand so the sun reflects off of it shunned back at us and it just kept on going slowly until it disappeared over the tree line and we lost sight of it i would say it was probably about a good three to four minutes we saw it for mm -hmm. um, you say we who's we me and my friend that was in the pool okay but the interesting thing is is that the direction that it was going to I didn't find out until years later after I created my Instagram account and was telling my story. I had someone reach out to me one day through my DMs and I try to answer everybody. I go through everybody's messages as best I can. So I read this one message and it's this individual who says, I just heard your story and I think I saw the exact same thing you saw at the exact same time in Brookhaven. I was like, Okay, that's interesting. And he tells me that he was yeah, outside. Like, like Brookhaven National Labs is nearby too. So I'll get to that in a second because you're going to find this interesting. So, <laughs> so he's telling me he's outside with his mother, his father, his sister, and they see a disc coming towards them from the distance. So then he goes into that. He goes, have you ever heard of the Brookhaven Lab incident? So at the time I had and I'm like, no, what was that? So he goes into explaining what had happened or whatever. And then I go and start doing my own investigation. And I was shocked to know that we actually had a crash UFO or incident that occurred right near the laboratory in a wooded area near the laboratory. And apparently that whole section was closed off by, I believe it was by the military. They wouldn't even let Suffolk Fire Department in. The only personnel that were allowed in the location were the workers from the laboratory. What year was this again? During the early 90s, 91, 92, I believe it was. Are you familiar with TWA Flight 800? Yes, I believe so. So there's a theory that that went down because at Brookhaven National Lab, they were testing microwave directed energy weapons, specifically so microwaves. I can't confirm you, that that was true. 
But what do you mean you can't confirm what was true? And they were experimenting on these kind of things at that time. I actually oh, got Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. I'm not saying you are. I'm just saying there was a... You're familiar with David Morehouse. He, I think, was... When he was working as a remote viewer in Project Stargate. So he worked for the... You know, he's reporting for the DIA and stuff like that. He investigated TWA Flight 800. And what he found out was... Again, this is, I don't know if this is true. I can't vouch for it. I'm just going to repeat it quickly. They were working on a directed energy weapon microwave, and they were trying to see if they could shield a Tomahawk cruise missile, right, from directed energy weapons. So they were running a test in the Atlantic. And what happened was at around the same time they were testing this thing, the TWA Flight 800 kind of got in the way. But if you look at the way, like the damage to the, the flight, right, and the equipment, it was very consistent with the effects of a microwave energy weapon. So the fact that there's a potential incident where there was a downed UFO, what would you use to take down a UFO? You'd probably use a directed energy weapon, which was, they were probably working on it for a oh, Look, I'm not, I'm just drawing connections. No, I'm not, so listen, I'm not, I'm not going to, I'm not going to, I'm not going to lie to you. I was given enough information to actually come up with my own theory as to what went down and to how it went down based off of what I was told as to who was running the facility at the time as well. If I'm not mistaken, I believe the individual that was heading the facility, because that location gets rented out in a sense to different organizations for a certain amount of time to do their whatever it is that they do. And then another group comes in and does what they do. So during that time, I was told by another individual who confirmed that the incident at Brookhaven was real, that the craft that I saw was real, and it was investigated by the CIA, that the facility was instructed by CIA to have surveillance cameras installed pointing upwards, because not only were they experimenting on that, but they were also testing with nuclear energy at the facility. They had a nuclear reactor there as well at that time. So after finding that out, and I actually know someone currently now who works at the facility, she was able to confirm to me as well that these things really were true at the time from the facility. And I literally came up with the exact same explanation. I'm like, okay, I have a good feeling that it was brought down. It was brought yeah, so, down so. and there was a worker who during a deathbed confession told his family that it, it wasn't a plane. There were witnesses from that first saw the craft crash. They thought it was a plane and then they described it. I believe it was like a cigar shaped or something like that with blue lights around it. But this individual had confirmed that not only was there craft, but bodies were brought to Brookhaven as well. So the same as the Virginia incident. Where after the crash, Virginia, but Virginia or Virginia, I believe. Virginia, I think. So, well, I believe it was after this. James released his documentary where they had the doctor, I believe it was that that came out for the first time, mm -hmm. talking about how the craft he saw after the crash that was doing like a grid-like pattern movement, almost like if it was searching. The feeling that I got was that I saw something that wasn't the crash, the object that crashed, but investigating what was happening. You understand? Like knew that this was there. And that's well, maybe why they wanted cameras pointed at the sky. Because yeah, they were yeah. like, what if whatever we shot down has people that want to come check them out? You well, know, I mean, they didn't they have the cameras there beforehand so they could shoot. Yeah, them. and it also could have been done on purpose as well, like you're saying, Darcy, to attract them to see if they come. Because if I'm not mistaken, I believe a few years ago, I think you know what I'm talking about, Darcy, where it was mentioned that the Navy was purposely creating scenarios out in the ocean with nuclear ships, I believe it was, to attract them, almost like creating traps to try to get them to come to investigate or to bring them down or whatever. They were actually doing these things on purpose because they knew that this stuff attracted them, that these nuclear devices would bring them in. So they were basically baiting them at one point. So that I makes would, sense. Yeah. That makes that, sense. That, 
I mean, yeah, if there's a history of these things being attracted to nuclear facilities, nuclear weapons, detonations, makes sense. I remember Lou Elizondo was talking about this massive craft that sucked a, a nuclear warhead. The torpedo, in, right? Yeah, torpedo off the coast of Puerto Rico. And they had like a helicopter and these like Navy SEALs or like scuba divers that were running up this rope to get back on the helicopter out of the ocean to get away from this ship that was coming from the deep to take away this torpedo. Yeah, it's, did, it, 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 if I recall everything? correctly, it sucked it up. <laughs> Around, around what year did that? I, I, I don't recall the year. I don't think he mentioned a year. Yeah, I, mean, I don't think he like did. Like one of these like cases that are classified and he's like kind of mentioning broadly what happened, but not the exact specifics because he can't do that yet. I double checked the Flight 800 incident. It happened on July 17th, 1996. So maybe a little bit after your incident, Andy, but... There were Navy SEALs associated with that, though, right? Because Morehouse looked at all the NOTAMs and notice to airmen in the area, and they were supposed to clear out the skies where that Flight 800, the corridor that Flight 800 passed through. But there was a Navy SEAL recovery team that, according to this story, were designated to recover the Tomahawk cruise missile after this directed energy weapon or directed microwave weapon took it down. And, you know, again, the Tomahawk cruise missile crossed paths with the aircraft and the aircraft got hit with this weapon. So maybe it's related. Maybe it's an, uh, there's another layer above that where maybe they weren't rad hardening a Tomahawk cruise missile. Maybe they were trying to take down something else. I mean, they claim to have ways of bringing them yeah. down from what I understand. So who knows, you know? All right. We've gone like way over. So any last words? This thing comes out on March 5th, right, Darcy? Yes, sir. Available on Amazon Prime, Apple TV, platforms like that. Check out my work. Really nice to talk to you, Sean. I, I like how you're very based and understand that this could be our technology. It could be their technology. Who knows, right? It's just all a mystery. So I'm with you on that. And Andy, any final words? By the way, thank you for the story. I like when people throw stuff out there and we cross pollinate. You know, I know a little bit, of th a few things. You know, a few things. But anyway, well, that's. Yeah. I mean, that's how you get the ultimate picture in the end. You know, that's kind of why I like to listen to other people's stories. I know there's a lot of crazy ones out there, but you do get your authentic ones. And when you put pieces of the puzzle together, you get a clearer picture as to what might be going on even though it's still not clear but yeah no i you know thank you for having me i appreciate it and i hope everybody enjoys the documentary i've seen it and it's very good not because i'm in it because <laughs> he did a very good job presenting the information and it's funny because <laughs> when i met darcy i had no idea that the documentaries i watched before that i was like i loved was his <laughs> the underground one because I was a fan of Phil's, and when I saw that, I was like, wow, whoever made this really went in on this shit. And it ended up being him. So I would highly recommend it because it is very well put together. It's got a lot of good information. Actually, a lot of stories that I haven't heard, and it's good. Highly recommend it. All right, well, gentlemen, it was an absolute pleasure. And folks, I'll put the link down in the description so that they can go and order it immediately. Because the sooner they get it, right, the better it'll do, right? Because it's kind of the first week is like the all-important week. But, well, better for them because they learn. <laughs> yeah, 100%. So thank you, gentlemen. It was an absolute pleasure and talk soon. Thank you. Thanks. Have a good, Have night. A good night. You too. If you enjoyed today's video, please hit like and subscribe. And also hit the notification button so you can be notified whenever I post new content. Thank you. Now, if you're enjoying the channel and you want to support it, there are several things you can do. In fact, there are five things you can do. The first thing you can do is just buy my books. I got plenty of books out in the market right now, and I would prefer that folks buy a book rather than giving me direct support because they get something out of it. They have a real tangible product. The second way you can support me 
is by becoming a member on YouTube or becoming a patron on Patreon. And just go to either site and it'll explain everything. Third way you can support the channel is by checking out my merch site, which is here. There's plenty of stuff that you could get to support the channel. And I'd appreciate that you, you have it and can wear it. Not only do you help support the channel, but you also help promote the channel, and I appreciate that. The fourth way that you can support the channel, and this is really easy, is anytime you want to buy something on Amazon, literally just go to the description below and click on any link, literally any link, the channel gets a cut of that, and it costs you no extra money. You just go through the link as I'm part of the Amazon Affiliates Club. The fifth and final way you can support the channel is through donations. Now, I don't prefer these because it's more of an expression of gratitude, but you don't really get anything out of it as a subscriber to the channel. However, if you decide to do these options, there's two options. There's Buy Me A Coffee, which is a separate site, and there's also you can go through YouTube with either Super Chat, Super Sticker, or Super Thanks. Again, I prefer Buy Me A Coffee because that organization takes less money than Amazon does. But either way, I appreciate any support you, you are willing to give the channel. So thank you very much and keep watching. I really appreciate it.